All right. Welcome, everybody. This is Joe McCall. This is the Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. I'm really glad you're here. And this, uh, you're in for a treat because we've got the one and only, the ultimate street smart investor, Lou Brown. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. <laughs> How you doing, Joe? <laughs> Good. Guys, Lou is a legend and I got him here on the podcast. So glad that you're here, Lou. Um, but let me just do a couple of house cleaning things real quick here, guys. Um, this is the Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. And so if you're listening to this um, on iTunes, please subscribe to the show. Leave a review. Leave a, Let us know what you think of the show. And um, subscribe. Leave a review. Really appreciate it. Also, if you're watching this live as we're recording this now, um, we are going live as we speak right now in YouTube and Facebook and Periscope. If you are watching us live, please type in the comments right now. Give us a thumbs up, like the video, share the video, say hello, tell us where you're from, say hi to Lou. You yeah, know, babe. I was uh, hanging out with Lou a couple <laughs> days ago in Florida, and uh, he was telling me some amazing stories of people that are multi, multi, multi millionaires doing deals that have never given him a testimonial, never even said hello to him. Lou didn't even know they existed, and they're like, one of the biggest house buyers in the entire country. And they come to Lou, like what was, how long ago was this last guy, Lou? Oh, th this was this year. <laughs> uh, he, I was at an event and in fact, I, it was a trade show and this guy walks up to me and I'm thinking, okay, he wants to talk to the vendor that I'm talking to. No, he wanted to talk to me. And he said, Hey Lou, I just want to let you know, my name's Steven Seal. I'm from Florida. He says, I want to let you know because of your system, because of your uh, whole enchilada system, I bought it 20 years ago. He said, we're now the 13th largest owner of single family homes in the United States. And we own 11,000 single family, or excuse me, uh, uh, land, pieces of land lots. And we've done it all with your system, with your trusts, with your owner financing, with your lease options. And I said, yeah, baby, that's Isn't good that stuff. Unfortunately, I hadn't seen him for 20 years. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. But that was, a, that was a great story. And it's exciting, you know, just to know that people can take the ball and run with it. You know, people can make things happen in their life. It's just amazing how quickly things can occur. He said he was a young guy. He said his wife didn't want to hear that he had spent any money on real estate investing and training uh, tools and things like that. And he said he sure is glad that he did it. And, you know, that just excites me when we see people just grow that quickly and really make things happen. That's, that's pretty much what I live for. Oh, man. And it's, if you, you know, don't know who Lou is. Okay. I'm going to ask him to introduce himself. Tell us a little bit about him. And uh, he has been in the business a long, long, long time. <laughs> and there's a reason why he calls his program street smart is because Lou has the street smarts. And not only has he done a ton of deals, he's coached tens of thousands of people to do deals as well. And uh, so it's a real honor and a privilege to have you here, Lou. I appreciate it. Um, and guys, again, if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook or Periscope right now, give us a thumbs up, say hello, tell us where you're from. Like we got top offers now says, Hey Joe, Jim from Aurora, Illinois. How you doing, Jim? Ah, uh, yeah, baby. Jonathan Smith. This is awesome. Eugene. Hey Joe and Lou, Eugene from West Palm beach, Florida. Glad you're here, man. Yay. Alex says hello. And yes, I'm on both your mailing lists. Ha ha ha. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. Now we're talking. <laughs> this is your one and maybe only chance to get to ask Lou questions. So if you've got questions and you want to ask him about, I mean, there's, there's nothing that he hasn't done, you know, trusts, lease options, subject to owner financing, wholesaling, fix and flip, short sales, you name it. Lou has done it and he's taught it. He has a course on it. And uh, this is the time to come in now and ask him some questions. Helga saying hello. Oh, yay. Eugene LeBranch, thank you. And, um, oh, this is a good question from Top Offers Now. Lou, how did you get through the last recession? Don't answer oh, that right now. Okay. No, All right. Let, that's a great question. <laughs> that we'll is. Get to that in a minute. Um, but, okay, cool. I'm excited, man. I'm super excited about this, Lou. Glad you're here. We were hanging out uh, a week or two weeks ago in Tampa. I've seen you around before, but I've never really had a chance to talk to you. And um, those courses right there above your head um, have have changed countless, countless lives. Uh, mine is one of them. 
Yes. Um, I had one of your courses. I don't remember which one. I, it must have been the whole enchilada where um, you, you're talking about trusts. And when I was first mm -hmm. getting started, you made it s such a, this complicated thing down to simple, easy to understand. Your paperwork on trusts was amazing. And um, so thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that, Joe. I really appreciate it. I'm just thrilled to be part of your audience and your team and just to spend some time with you today because it's always exciting. I hear so many good things about you and your podcast and just a lot of people that get turned on, get a lot of great information from you. So I appreciate what you do as well. Thank you. All right. So can we rewind way back, Lou? When did you get started in real estate? Well, if you go all the way back, I bought my first house when I was 18 years old. I, I was able to put it under contract. And then right after my birthday, I closed on it. So officially I owned it at 19 years old, wow. but it's the first house I ever lived in. I was raised by my mom. She was a war bride. She came over on the Queen Mary. Wow. She had met her American trooper husband. Everything was going to be fantastic. Uh, then she got here to America and she found out he was an alcoholic and he was an abuser and she was strong enough to get out of that relationship and say, you know what? <laughs> you Goodbye. So she was here by, by herself. Uh, and then she met my father. I jokingly say uh, her second mistake. <laughs> so, so it ended up just being the two of us. Yikes. And uh, you imagine being in this country. She was from Scotland. Her whole family was over there. Nobody was over here. She didn't have money. Back then you had to pay for international telephone calls and it was very expensive. So she wasn't able to really even connect. I mean, it was letters back and forth to Edinburgh, Scotland. And um, pretty much she was here by herself and uh, it was just a struggle. We didn't have any money at all. I make a joke about uh, our, our dining table was a Samsonite card table that we bought with s &H green stamps from the s &H green stamp store. And wow. that's how we furnished our apartment. So I've definitely lived both sides of the equation uh, from, from not having money to having money. And I just like to say that rich is better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so I was able to buy my first house because I had a prod. Uh, it was one of her friends. Uh, I called her Aunt Mabel. And what Aunt Mabel did was uh, she had bought the duplex that she lived in. I was eight years old and she essentially was telling me that the people on the other side were paying enough money to cover the mortgage on the property, which meant that she was living for free. And that's when I learned about parallel universes. I, I learned out, learned that we were hiding out from the rent man and she was living for free. And I said, man, I got to learn what she's up to. But of course I'm eight years old. I don't know what's, what's going on. Uh, and then she told me she bought the duplex a year later next door. And the people on one side were paying enough money to cover the mortgage and the other money was theirs. And they had a great lifestyle, went to the steakhouse every night, went on cruises. They just had a great life. And I realized that uh, they were getting free using real estate. And so that was an eye opener. And then she told me at 18 years old, she says, you need to buy a house. And I'm thinking, wow, Aunt Mabel, you go to banks and qualify for loans. How in the world could I buy a house? But she turned me on to her friend, Realtor Sue. Realtor Sue took me around, showed me properties, and I was able to put a property under contract by taking over the existing financing on the property. What, so what that year was this, Lou? Yeah, baby. That was, what was, what year was that? That was a, 1976, I think was uh, my first property. And, um, and uh, it was, it was just fantastic. So oh, I found it. I uh, found it. Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> uh oh, you, you're finding your enchilada. <laughs> no, this is something different. This is something different. I'm sure he's a friend of yours, Robert Allen. Of course. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing down. Robert Allen, nothing down. Yes. Totally revised for the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I own that book, Joe. <laughs> the new revised edition of the Alt Testament. So you were doing this before Robert Allen. Yeah, baby. I was able to take over the existing financing. It was an awesome thing. I didn't have to go to the bank. I didn't have to qualify for a loan. And that was really kind of uh, my first lesson in real estate that I realized 
that I could buy a home at 18 years old. I could do it by taking over existing financing. Didn't matter what my credit looked like. Didn't matter how much money I had in the bank. Didn't have to qualify for a loan. I didn't have to do any of the traditional things in real estate. And that was kind of an aha moment for me that pretty much, uh, geared my entire existence in real estate because I realized just because somebody says that's the way it is, doesn't mean that's the way it is. And so I learned some unique twists on how to do our business. And as a result, fast forward over 40 years, I've never been to the bank. I've never qualified for a loan on a single family or small multifamily property because I learned something amazing. Everybody take a note on this. Uh, the seller is the bank. The seller is the bank. And when you learn what to say and how to say it, Joe, it's just amazing. People will do amazing things when you've got the magic words and you've got the right attitude and you've got the attitude of support and help and service for the other person. It's amazing what they're willing to do to help you. That's really good. Again, guys, we got guys like Ken from Facebook here saying, thanks Joe for bringing Lou online. Yeah, baby. John, hello from San Antonio, Texas. Suzette says hello here as well. Mm. So again, this is the time to come and ask questions. I got Lou for only another 30, 40 minutes. And uh, want, if you got any questions, I want you to bring them to us because I'm going to ask Lou your deepest, most difficult, hardest question. I can guarantee you Lou has dealt with it. He has the answer for it. And uh, so we can get into, this is our chance now to get into some, uh, get into his brain and get some wisdom out of this. Um, so Lou, how, you know, you started doing deals when you were 18. What yeah. was after that? What, what was your journey kind of into um, becoming a full-time real estate investor. You know, it's an interesting thing. So I was working, I got a job and of course I went to college a whole year and uh, I was, <laughs> it was a scholarship that I got to go to Central Piedmont Community College in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, through, I got the scholarship through junior achievement. It was awesome. But I realized when I was in school that they weren't teaching me anything that I could really apply to life, you know? And since I'd had a life of hard knocks already, I really didn't want to waste any time. So I had to break the news to my mom and all of her friends and just say, you know what? I think I'm going to sit out a year and see what I can do. And then if that doesn't work out, I'm going to go back. And uh, I, I say, fortunately, I never went back and uh, I just got into this game early and I realized, you know, working for the other guy wasn't such a cool gig. And that if I instead found a way to work for myself, I would be a lot more uh, wealthy and successful and free. And so that's pretty much how I geared my life. I was working for another company. Uh, they moved me from Charlotte, North Carolina to Atlanta, Georgia. And what happened was uh, they said, we're going to bribe you. Basically, they didn't say those words, but they said, if you sell your house in Charlotte, we're going to pay the closing costs. And if you buy another house in Atlanta, we're going to pay the closing costs mm. and we're going to move you and we're going to put things on the truck and, and ship yep. it down there and, and pay for everything and give you a company car and all expenses. I said, yeah, baby, count me in. Uh, and so that's exactly what happened. Uh, I'd sold that house in Charlotte and I moved and for a 37% profit, by the way, in just wow. less than two years. And so I, I realized, you know, that was a good thing. That was a good thing, but I was working for the man. And so I had to do what they told me to do. And, but the bribe was that they would pay my closing costs. Well, I couldn't turn that down. That was worth thousands of dollars. So sure enough, I went to Atlanta. I told the real estate agent, Hey, I want to buy a house just like I bought the last house, taking over the existing financing on the property, go for it. <laughs> and when I come down on the weekend, I want you to show me a whole bunch of houses that uh, are just like that. Wow. Sure enough, she did. And I was able to buy that second home. And uh, that's where I, I married my wife and raised a couple of kids for a couple of years anyway. And uh, then we bought our first uh, duplex. <laughs> we got yeah. that from Aunt Mabel. And I did that by taking over the existing financing. Wow. And back then, Joe, it was 1980. I don't always remember what's happening in 1980, but uh, interest oh. rates were 21%. Oh, yeah. So 21% uh, interest. Just imagine everybody on here, just imagine that interest rates were 21% in this country, this country right here. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy Carter. And 
<laughs> so what happened was uh, we, uh, I was able to get the seller to carry back financing. So what, that's what how I got the into seller's finance. What was the seller's interest rate? Well, the seller's interest rate was 12 and a half percent. But that was, hey, a good deal. that was a bargain. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, the the thing was that my uh, cash flow on that one property was six dollars and sixty seven cents per month. And you say, why in the world would anybody buy something with such a low interest rate? I mean, such a low cash flow. Well, the answer is because that was at the time that Ronald Reagan came into power and introduced a tax bill where you could double the depreciation on a property. So because I was working for another company and I was getting such great tax benefits, the, the net gain on that deal was significant because of the tax benefits. Mm -hmm. And back then the taxes were rather high. And so it was not, uh, it was a no brainer really for me to buy some real estate, get the depreciation, get the double depreciation on a property and get the seller to carry back financing and take over the seller's existing loan. And sure enough, that worked out great. And then uh, as time progressed, I was able to uh, build a, a business and left my job and went actually bought a business. Guess what? Guess what? With owner financing, got yeah. the owner to carry back financing on yeah. the business, on the business inventory, and then was able to parlay that into my real estate career and went full time in 1983. Full time, 1983. Yeah, baby. So was your, how are you making the money to live on? Was it from the cash flow? Uh, was it from flipping deals? What was you it? know, that's a great question. Because of the fact that I had built this uh, business, I was able to sell that business on owner financing for a two year note, got an income stream on a monthly basis. I used that as my cash flow so I could get my real estate business going. Hmm. And, uh, and I did everything I could do. I went to every seminar. I bought every book. I mean, I was into the education side of it and learned as much as I could. And then I started really doing it uh, as a business and it, it uh, has just been fantastic ever since. So even back, what was the education industry like in the 80s? Uh, well, it was Robert Allen, nothing down. It yeah. Rand, uh, Rand, you know, they started the uh, Rand groups around the country. They've since evolved into RIAs, Real yeah. Estate Investor Associations, but he was the one that really kind of started it. Uh, even before him was Albert Lowry, uh, and started uh, the, the uh, Lowry Nickerson groups. And then they were kind of competitors of a Rand. And then I think Lowry turned them over to uh, Robert Allen. And so that was kind of my foundation. And mm, when, did, uh, when, did Carlton Sheets, when did Carlton Sheets um, come onto the scene? He was definitely around at that time for sure. Okay. And uh, in fact, uh, I know Carlton, he's a really great guy. And uh, he, in fact, we led uh, a bus tour uh, back in the early nineties uh, in, in Las Vegas and uh, had, had a good time with that. By the way, when we're offline, would you mind putting me in touch with Carlton Sheets? I'd love to get him on the podcast. Mm. Would he be open to that? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, baby. I don't yeah, want to steal your, I don't want to steal your yeah, baby. Oh, but I love stealing it. It's, it's contagious. Don't worry. <laughs> People don't okay. forget it. We got Bobby Jam. Oh, wow, Joe. It's the man, Lou Brown. That's yeah, right. baby. <laughs> Chris. Hey, Joe and Lou. And uh, we've got some good questions here. Harry saying hello. Oh, um, gosh, Harry. Yeah, baby. Jesse Mills. Jesse's a friend of mine. Holy cow. <laughs> um, got us, we get, we're getting some really good questions here, and I want to get to them. Keep all the questions coming if you're watching this on Facebook and YouTube. This is like a free coaching call. Uh, yeah. You can ask Lou questions and all that good stuff. All right. So Lou, um, you started going full-time in the mid eighties doing real estate. Do you just keep on buying homes? Is that your strategy? Owner you know, subject to Joe, I, I, I'm that kind of guy that really, I look, I look at an asset and if that asset can produce income, why sell it? Uh, so I've been a buyer and holder of real estate since the early, early days and still believe in it to this day. You know, when I look at my ROIs, when I compare it to apartment buildings, when I compare it to commercial properties, when I compare it to any other type of investment out there, I'm just shocked and amazed with the amount of control that we have over our properties and the usability of it, the transferability of it, the access yeah. to the marketplace, the demand. I mean, there's just, I can't find a better 
investment than single family and small multifamily properties. Oh, I agree. Well, and it's not changed in the last 40 years, has it? Nope. No, it's only gotten better, frankly. It's only gotten better. Yeah. It's not going to change in the next 40 years either. Everybody got to have a place to live. You and know, I heard one that's time. That's a great business to be in. If you look at the population trend growth in the United States, um, I don't remember where I heard this. I wish I could verify it. Somebody verify it for me. It was something like along the lines, the U.S., the population of the United States is going to double in the next 50 years. Yep. You're talking in, in, in 2070. Um, is that right? Wow. Uh, yeah, I can give you some stati statistics to support that just by going backwards and seeing how it's doubled over the last decades. And in fact, um, we have 10,800 people born every day and only 7,600 die. So that was it a net gain of 3,600 people every single day just in births. And those are the legal ones. <laughs> so yeah. you, you throw in the illegals and you're throwing the 1 million that we add to our population every year legally that go through normal uh, avenues of, of access to the United States. So we got a million extra people every year. Plus we got 3,600 people a day that are going to ripen, you know, in the next uh, 20, 30 years and they're going to want housing. And so it's just a snowball that is not going to stop uh, rolling people for sure. Always need a roof over their heads. Ralph Newton says the golden goose buy and hold. Amen. Yeah, absolutely right. Okay. So Lou, um, come into the nineties, you know, mm. um, you saw the dot com bubble. Oh yeah. Go up. Um, it was a great time to buy houses and it, it, things kind of had a bump, you know, in the late nineties, early two thousands. Right. Oh yeah. Um, well, if we go in the eighties, you know, that was back in the days of the RTC resolution trust corporation. Oh, so That's when, close. when they, um, imploded the savings and loan industry on purpose. And when they did that, it created a huge amount of assets. It was all taken into a corporation that was run by the federal government called the Resolution Trust Corporation. And it was very, very good to me. I will tell you, <laughs> it was, so we were able to go in, we were able to buy notes. We were able to buy homes at pennies on the dollar. It was great. I still have some of those properties wow. to this day. And uh, that was a great time. And then, so one thing you want to know about real estate is it is cyclical, right? It comes and goes. Why does it come and go? It's because of household formations. It's because of generations. And as the generations produce babies, they produce these bubbles of demand and supply, lack of supply, uh, higher demand. And so these bubbles are always going to happen. I'm on, I'm going into my fifth, real estate cycle now. So I've seen it come and go. I know exactly what it looks like and it's fun. It's neat. Mm. Uh, it's neat in that you can buy equities for pennies on the dollar and it's neat in that you can make a lot of cash flow off of those equities forever. Uh, so I kind of looked at that as I was building my business and I said, you know, what can I do to even things out? What can I do no matter what the economy does, no matter how challenging it gets, what is it that I can do with my business that shifts me into a different direction that, that handles a lot of the issues that uh, we do face as real estate investors. And that's when I happened upon the concept of really, deep diving into the, to being the bank for my customers. So I say the seller is the bank. I really mean that in two ways. The seller's the bank when you're buying and the seller's the bank you when you are selling and you learn that you are much better off when you are in the finance business than the real estate business. So the real estate business to me is real estate is just a commodity to get to the financing side of things. And when I can actually provide financing for my customers, well, there's a reason that those uh, banks have those tall buildings and yeah. marble floors and drive through windows and all those employees, they are using the miracle of compounding as uh, Ben Franklin says. So if you had a, a, a single family home, hundred thousand dollars single family home in the Midwest, would you rather rent it out or sell it with owner financing for 30 years? Oh, I, 40 years. And <laughs> yeah, we do, we do 40 year financing. I would much rather sell it. Well, first of all, think about the transference that's just occurred. You know, uh, people kind of, I say enslave themselves into a thing called landlording. And I tried that. 
<laughs> I've been there and done that. I'm a veteran of over a thousand section eight contracts, for example. So I, I know what landlording looks like. And I realized that if I could just be a conduit, if I could provide a commodity to the public and if I could be a conduit for that, and if I could finance it for them, I would be far better off. And they would too, by the way, um, in having for themselves and their family, a place that they can raise their kids and nobody's breathing down their neck about the dog running around in the backyard or anything like that. And I realized, you know, I never call my mortgage company about my water here, never call them about uh, the roof on the house, never call them about anything that's the toilet being stuffed up. That's not the mortgage company's problem. They'd say that sounds like a personal problem to me and slam down the phone. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, baby, that sounds like a plan. <laughs> How do I get on that side of the game? So sure enough, I started gearing my whole business towards helping people to end up with home ownership. We call it the path to home ownership. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I wrote a book, a, a, I'll show it to you. It says, uh, never pay rent again, the path to home ownership. Wow. And the idea was really to help people to learn just how easy it is to get home ownership when you've got someone like myself in your local community that will actually be the bank for you instead of having to qualify for loans at a traditional bank. Even when, because I get this question a lot sometimes, Lou, like even when financing is easy, <coughs> like it was back before the last crash, um, even when financing is easy, if you could fog a mirror, you could get a financing loan. <laughs> what, why, why does they, what, what can we as investors bring to the table? when it is so easy to get financing. You mean from the bank, from a tr traditional lender? Yeah. From a traditional lender getting a home loan. Well, my advice is of course, like I said, street smart, the street smart way to do things is don't go to the bank and don't qualify for loans. Learn what to say and how to say it to get sellers to be the bank for you. Take right. over their existing financing. If they have equity, have them carry back that financing and don't go to the bank. Uh, first of all, banks are fickle, but when times get bad or when they even think times are going to be bad, they can call loans. Uh, many investors end up with things called blanket loans where they, they blanket all over all of your assets. And then they can just merely look, wake up one day and say, you know what? We feel that we're insolvent today. We feel that you're assets are not worth what we have them on the books for. So therefore pay off your loan. And I've seen people over the decades lose their entire hmm. life's work over that nonsense. So my advice, Joe, is stay out of the banks. Do not trust them. They are not trustworthy. They merge, they shift, they change. Whoever you're talking to might not be there next week. Never mind. Just don't do it. Become the bank. Become the bank. And now you have control over your entire future. That's really good. Um, let's talk about the last bubble real quick in uh, 2006. Well, to, it started kind of in 2008. Um, what were you doing at that time and what mm -hmm. got you through it? You know, I used to do a lot of renovations. I, I big, 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 they used to call me Mr. Kirkwood here in Atlanta. Uh, Cause I did 26 houses in one neighborhood at one time. Wow. And, uh, and so, <laughs> so I used to just go from property to property because my kids were actually in a school not far from there. And so I would drop them off in the morning and go from property to property and they'd pick them up in the afternoon and go home. But so, so I kind of filled my time by, by becoming wow. Mr. Kirkwood. Yeah. And, uh, and the funny thing was that I was doing all these renovations. Of course, that's when you used to buy, fix up and sell. And that was kind of my, my, in addition to the buy and hold philosophy, I was making some really good money regentrifying neighborhoods, uh, taking older homes, restoring them, making them spectacular columns and granite and beautiful bathrooms and the whole nine. And then once it was restored, selling it and taking that cash, parlaying it into other properties and just kept the ball rolling that way. But just like we were talking about cycles before, it's like musical chairs. And so basically you might be left standing and, and uh, right there at the end of 2008, that's exactly what happened to me. I had 10 properties. I bought them right. I bought them cheap. I fixed them up beautifully. They were on the market. People were raising their hand. They were loving it. I had bought them at auction. They were terrific deals. And 
they were signing contracts and all of a sudden the bank said, no, 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 no. And so all of those contracts fell through. I was not able to get them sold. I started, you know, thinking, wow, what is it about the economy? You know, here we go. We're getting another cycle now. What could I have done differently? And that's when in January of 2009, I made a decision and I said, you know, I'm going to change the entire way that I do my business. Um, I realized that my problems in real estate have never come from the buying side. I was always able to buy houses, right? Buy them cheap, buy them with seller financing, zero interest, take over existing loans. There was so many ways I could buy properties. That was not my problem. My problem was always the selling side when I was dependent upon the marketplace and dependent upon people coming through and qualifying for loans and all the issues with credit and everything else. And I said, you know, what if I shifted and changed everything I'm doing? And what if I went and found my buyers first? What if I went ahead and got them qualified first? I found out exactly what their credit looked like, how much down payment they have, how much they can afford on a monthly basis, what number of bedrooms they want, what number of bathrooms they want, where do they want to live? And I actually go and resource a property for them. And then I, aha, aha, aha. <laughs> so, so then I've designed an entire marketing campaign around attracting those kind of people. And then when they come into our world, we're able to actually cipher them. You know, we're able to actually identify who they are and what they're up to and where they're at in their life and then determine exactly what would work for them. And then we can go resource a property for them. I can own or finance it for them. I can buy it right and buy it cheap and take over existing financing. Then I can be the bank for them on the sales side. I can make a spread in between. They can be happy. They can raise their kids there. They can choose the paint colors. They can choose the carpet colors. They can fix up the house at their leisure. I can give them credit towards their down payment for doing some or all of the repairs. Yeah. And so that was the big shift, Joe, that I, I came to when I came to that, that time frame. It's funny that you would mention that. Yeah. Yeah. So these were deals that you would stay in the middle of then, right? So you found a buyer who's got 10, 15 grand to put down on a house. You know, they're, they, they need an area a house in this area. You go find it to them and you wouldn't just wholesale it back to them, right? You would, you would find a way to buy it, turn around, buy it with owner finance or some kind of creative financing and turn around and sell it to that end buyer, but stay in the middle, right? Yeah, baby. That's exactly right. Uh, be the bank for them. And okay. that doesn't mean that they're ready today uh, for that process. So that may mean they only had 1% for a move-in fee or, or 3.7 to 5% for an option fee, or they might have 10%. Now they've moved into what I call the owner finance or in-house financing arena. So then when they get into the in-house financing arena, that's when we provide them what we call an agreement for deed and we give them the agreement to get the deed at some later date when they pay us off. So yeah. they, during that process, they can actually get qualified. They can improve their credit to the point that they can now qualify for a traditional loan from a bank. And that's when you get your, your chunks of money. I call it bits and pieces and hunks and chunks. So uh, that's when you get your chunk of money. So we start, start out with bits and pieces and then we get hunks of money when they move in and we get chunks of money uh, when they cash us out. Okay. Um, can I go through and ask, ask you some of these questions here? Absolutely. Luke? And then I want to talk to you about trusts and I want to talk to you about certified, your certified affordable housing program, because this Excellent. is really important. It's really needed in the industry. So I want to talk to you about that. Thank um, you. Uh, this one right here. Thoughts on wholesaling REO properties. Have you ever done that? You wholesaled a property that a bank owns? Right. So it's definitely an opportunity. And usually the reason you're not buying that is because you don't have the cash to buy that. I would say, uh, let me teach you how to go find that money <laughs> because I've funded those kind of deals with private funds where I don't have to wholesale the properties. I actually purchase those properties. Listen, you're paying pennies on the dollar. You're giving somebody like me a great opportunity. By the way, I love wholesalers. Put me on your wholesale list. I, I do buy from wholesalers throughout the month 
we love wholesalers and I also beg wholesalers to come to my class. And I say, you don't know what you're giving away. <laughs> I'm making 30, 40, 50, a hundred thousand dollars on this one property. Let me show you how you can do that too. So but what you're talking about right now <laughs> is like, if you're a wholesaler, you most wholesalers only have one offer to give to sellers, right? That's it's right. cash. You're, you can teach them how to make different offers That's and, right. and maybe buy a deal that, the seller wouldn't take your offer at 70 cents on the dollar, right? Amen. In fact, that's one of the things I tell wholesalers is look, if you've got a deal that's, you know, you're having troubles with, it's not working out. Let me know about that. I probably have a solution for that. I love bad titles. I love, I love troubled properties. I love all that kind of stuff because there's such a narrow number of folks that actually know what to do with that stuff. It's a great opportunity. And so when, when I'm talking to a wholesaler, I say, listen, does that home have any existing financing on it? And they say, well, gee, I don't know. Well, they didn't know because they don't know. They don't know that that's actually an opportunity. And so I say, okay, well go back and find out if it's got any existing financing. So sure enough, they'll come back and say, yeah, it's got a loan. How much is that loan? What's the interest rate? What's the term? What's the payment? How much longer do they have on the loan? I don't know. <laughs> go back and find that out. Yeah. And so they come back to me and I'll say, okay, here's what I want you to do. And then have them go back to their seller and actually restructure that deal so that we can take over the existing financing on the property. And I can actually pay the wholesaler more for that kind of property than I can on just an REO property. So, uh, so yes, we do buy REO properties and yes, I would be willing to wholesale them if I had to. Yeah. Okay, good. When you buy a property, because this relates to the next question here, uh, Lou, what is the hardest subject to that you've ever done? Would you please define subject to? And when you buy a property, are you actually taking title to it or are you doing a contract for deed with the seller? So when I'm taking title to a property, it always depends on what the existing financing is. Uh, typically, if you know, back in the day, I would consider doing lease options and owner finance, excuse me, uh, lease options and agreement for deed with a seller. Pretty much I don't have to anymore with my credibility, with what we do and how we do it. The, the sellers are just willing to give me the deed to the property. Uh, bought one this morning, subject to the existing loan. Um, and it, it's just great. And so once you learn the magic words, they will allow you to take over their existing financing on the property. And uh, was that, did that cover your question? Well, yeah. So define a subject to is when you buy a house subject to the existing mortgage, right? Right. So if there's existing financing on the property, I want to know all about it. I want to know what the interest rate is, what the term is, what the payment is, because that's, financing, that's money that I don't have to raise from another source. That's points that I don't have to pay to raise that money. Uh, that's payments that are baked into that deal that I can just take over and make those payments. And I can start right away. I don't have to wait 30 days or 60 days until I qualify for a loan from a lender. Heck, I can just take over that existing financing right now. That's the way to go, baby. Okay, good. So what's the hardest subject to you've ever done? Ken Cole has this question. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I bought an apartment complex one time. And, uh, and so I'm that guy that doesn't want to qualify for loans at banks. Right. And, and so the seller of the property had this wonderful $900,000 loan on the property. And I went, yeah, baby, count me in. I wanted to take over the existing financing, but I was also aware that that was a commercial transaction. And I knew that I couldn't get away with in a commercial deal, what I can get away with in a single family deal. So I said, I got to be careful about this. So I, in my contract said that that's the way I was buying that property is taking over the existing financing. Well, of course, the, we had to get lender approval. A well, lender says, oh yeah, we'll be glad to. We're going to underwrite you. We're going to qualify you. Give us all your basic information as well as your underwear size and your grandmother's maiden name and everything else. And of course that's not me. So I said, what if, what if I just paid you? <laughs> what if I just give you a point on this deal? 
and then I take over the existing financing and you've got a wonderful property and it's got significant equity. So yeah. you know that you're not going to get hurt on this deal. Well, sure enough, they agreed to do that. I would say that was my most difficult subject too. I've had some interesting other ones. I had one that I, I bought from a, uh, a paralegal uh, that uh, worked in a law firm here in Atlanta, the largest law firm in the South. Um, and she, worked on the 42nd story or whatever. Uh, and she was in the litigation department <laughs> and I figured well, as soon as I found that out, when I'm sitting there going over my cost to sell worksheet and everything with her and, and, you know, making nice and finding out, Oh, she worked. Oh, she works for a law firm. Oh, how interesting. Oh, she's a paralegal. Oh, how interesting. Wait till she hears how I want to buy her house. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, not only did she sell me the house, she let me take over her first mortgage and her home equity line of credit. And she let me take the house uh, with all the furniture in it that she didn't want. Uh, and uh, she, uh, let's see, she carried the loan for several months uh, and made the payments until we got control of the property. So it, it was just a wonderful transaction. We made the deal in September and she moved in December. It worked out great. That was in fact last year. What, um, did is what can go wrong in a subject to well, drawbacks or things? Well, absolutely. One of the things that can go wrong is that the seller runs their mouth to the lender and tells them that they've sold the house. Uh, the lender has the right in the due upon sale clause in the mortgage, they have the right to call that loan due. And so that is a prerogative that they have. It doesn't say they will or shall call the loan due. It says they may call the loan due. Well, that says they may not as well. And so that's kind of the premise that I work under. However, you've got to warn your seller not to tell the lender or the lender can actually, and in fact is required under their pooling and servicing agreement to, to do that. I mean, it's not their loan. They're typically servicing the loan for someone else. Yeah. So you go running your mouth, they run their mouth. All of a sudden now they have to live up to the terms of the agreement that they've entered into and trigger that due upon sale clause. So that's, that's one thing that can go wrong, Joe. And another thing that can go wrong is you don't make your payments. Mm -hmm. Now that's something that is sacrosanct, that's sacred. And, and it's absolutely what I teach. Listen, you don't make your own payment on your own house before you don't make that payment. I mean, it's a gift from God when somebody lets you take over their existing financing and they let you take, make the payments and the loan is remaining on their credit report. Listen, that is your responsibility. If you can't make those payments, something happens in your life, then you bring in another investor, you bring in somebody else is going to make sure that those payments are made no matter what, or you get that house sold and you get that loan paid off because yeah. you face that person and you said you were going to make those payments, you better darn well make sure you do that. So a lot of people ask, okay, so what if the bank does call the loan due? And I want to ask you about trust because that yeah. helps prevent a lot of that. Oh but, um, yeah, baby. Trust what if, is- What if they is, do call it due? Well, uh, first of all, you got to plan ahead. you got to plan for the possibility that that could happen. And one of the things you got to do is when you purchase that property, it must absolutely positively must be bought in trust. Now I teach a thing called land trusts and what happens with a land trust, been using land trusts since 1984 and been teaching them since 1986. And it's the best thing since sliced bread, man. It is awesome. It not only allows you to buy property subject to, but there's about 30 other benefits of trust that you cannot get with any other entity, not a corporation, not an LLC, not a limited partnership. You can only get it with a trust. So I love, love, love trusts for not only what they can do to allow us to make money, but also the protection, the privacy, the probate avoidance. There's just so many good things that trust bring to the table, but most people don't know about them. And the good news from a deal standpoint is that the lender is prohibited from calling the loan due when the property is placed in trust, when you do it the right way with the right paperwork, following the appropriate steps, the lender cannot call the loan due. Right. Yeah. And so that's super important. So let's talk about trust some more. What is a trust and um, why, uh, why would, 
why and by the way i'm going to shut my camera off and mute myself for just a minute but would you just please talk to us about what a trust is and uh why how does it work okay sure thing so what a trust is is a contract it's a contract between the trustee and the beneficiary so what happens is that in that contract and it's such a great thing that it actually outlines who's responsible for what. So the trustee holds the deed to the property. They hold the title to the property. They hold the control over the property. The beneficiary is, gets all the benefits of the property. So tax benefits, income benefits, all those things come to the beneficiary. So it's a really great thing to be a beneficiary. And then, what a trust does is actually holds the title to the property for the benefit of the beneficiary or the beneficiaries, if there's multiple beneficiaries and then their heirs. So inside the trust, you can also outline who is going to be the beneficiary of the trust. Now, as well, not only beneficiary of the trust, but the beneficiary of the beneficiaries. So what we call successor beneficiaries. So the, assets, the income, the tax benefits, everything come down to the beneficiary. Then below that, uh, if that beneficiary is no longer living, then it immediately goes to their heirs and there's no probate, there's no attorneys, there's no cost, there's no delay, there's no aggravation, breaking up families, all that nonsense that typically happens inside of the probate process can all be avoided just using trusts. So that's one of the very big reasons that every single person should get a trust. Every single person, if you own real estate, if you own vehicles, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, bank accounts, CDs, CDUs, mobile homes, motor homes, gun collections, coin collections, every single thing in your life can be in individual trusts. I also teach something called personal property trust. So if it's not real estate, it goes into a personal property trust. And then you've got certain paperwork that does the job to number one, pass those assets as you require, as you state inside the trust so that they go to the heirs that you want to see get each of those assets. And then the income and so on can just be passed down from generation to generation. Yeah, that's good. So Larry, I'm sorry, Lou, when you're doing these deals, um, do you get a local title company, an attorney to help you with it, to keep it above board, you know, setting yep. up these trusts. Uh, some people get really intimidated by that and you you teach how to do it, but do you also recommend getting a local attorney or title company to help you with it? Sure. Uh, it's important. You start with a foundation. They're going to charge you a fortune if they're creating it from nothing. Yeah. And uh, so what I use is documents that I've gotten approved by the American probate council using the laws of all 50 States. We designed special documentation that does exactly that. And then I say, Hey, now I'm, and I've got a link for people to be able to get um, a legal shield through me. And, and then I have them have a legal shield attorney sign off on the documents for their state. So what happens is now they're able to, you know, have something in their file that says they're state compliant uh, as well. You know, there's some unique things here and there. It's not a big deal. You've still got the foundation of things far cheaper to start with a foundation, have somebody review it than it is to actually have them create it from scratch. And one of the biggest issues, Joe, is that an attorney, they can tell you the legal side of things, but they don't always focus on the strategic side of things. And there's many, many benefits and strategies of privacy that can come from the use of trust that attorneys don't know. They don't advise you on because maybe you didn't ask that question, yeah. but also because they just don't know themselves. Yeah. So, you know, on your personal deals, do you still use a title company to help you close these? Oh, absolutely. Do you do it on your own? So we, we closed part of it in terms of the trust side of it. And then the title company does the title search and then they do the HUD one closing statement and they do uh, the seller acknowledgements and things like that. That's what the closing attorney does. Nice. Okay, good. When you, when you, when you, you teach us all over the country, do you teach students to find a good investor friendly title company or escrow company, whatever in their oh. Absolutely. You've got to have a team member that understands what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, if they, if you don't have a good team member, see 
often when you're purchasing a property in the contract, they'll say it's to be closed at Dewey Cheatham and how <laughs> law firm, whatever. Yeah. And I, I say, that's nice. However, under RESPA, Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, he who pays the closing costs is the one that gets to choose the closing attorney. So since we're typically paying the closing costs on the purchase side, we get to choose our attorney regardless of what the contract says. So that's coming back to your point of, yes, you want a team member that understands what you're doing, understands how you do it. And then we put in our contracts when we're selling a property or purchasing a property, we have the a leverage to do so. We always put our title company's name in that contract so that they know us, they like us, they love us. We're bringing them a lot of business. We're referring business to them. And so they're going to go the extra mile to make sure that that closes and closes the right way. Very and good. then they're going to be there for you if there's a problem later. That's another key element to this whole thing. Lawyers make mistakes all the time. Title companies and their staff make mistakes all the time. Things don't get filed. They don't get filed right. There's just all kinds of issues with paperwork that ought to not be that way, but it's that way. And so when you've got a team member and you have a problem like that, they'll step up and they'll make sure that that gets taken care of. What do you recommend with, or what do you teach with when it comes to the insurance? Um, does the, does a trust become an additional insured? The owner stays the primary insured? No, no. Uh, we definitely change the insurance to the name of the trust. Uh, and we uh, put it in care of uh, because we become the manager of the property. And so there's a, and in fact, that's legitimate. There's a management agreement. Uh, the trustee of the trust hires you to be the manager of the property. So I have a management agreement in my system. And then because of that, you're able to have yourself named on that policy as well. So it's the name of the trust name of the, trust and trustee are named as the insured. The additional insured is you as their interest may appear. It's called a TEMA. Good. And um, so the banks, they just want to make sure that this house is insured. That's, that's right. That's right. And that's what we want to see now when it's a situation where it's a subject to transaction, we have to be careful about that because there is a trigger there that the lender sees, wait a minute, this is not, something that we do. So we are definitely uh, careful about that process and often we'll leave the insurance in place as it is, but also get our own insurance uh, with ourselves named as the, uh, as the insured on the secondary insurance that we get. Not yeah. that we can collect on two policies, we can't, but we're going to definitely file under our insurance instead of that other insurance, not rock the boat with the lender at all. Yeah, that's what I used to do. I, I would keep that existing insurance in place and it was always usually escrowed anyway. So I just keep on paying it. Um, okay. Totally agree with that. Uh, Edna's got a good question here. Do you need a real estate license for this stuff? Ah, no, you don't. And a real estate license can actually help. Uh, so if you do have one, um, there's some additional profit centers and some additional benefits you can get, but no, you do not need a real estate license to buy hold and sell properties as long as you're not matching a buyer and a seller and taking a commission in between. But when you become a principal in the transaction, you are a beneficiary of the trust, for example, then absolutely you can do that. And then you can sell to a third party and not have to worry about having a real estate license. Excellent. Tom Kroll, mutual friend of ours. Thanks. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila's got a good question here. A family trust or a land trust? What do you, what do you so Sheila, that's a great question. So a land trust has some benefits that a traditional living trust does not have. And, you know, I said there's 30 different benefits of trust. And one of the benefits that a land trust does is it actually converts real estate into personal property interests. So as a result, you can't do that with the other types of trusts. And so because of the wording of the documents itself, your interests in it are not in the land. So for example, if somebody slips and falls, if there's PCBs on the soil, if there's lead in the home, whatever it might be, that could also create some personal liability. However, if you don't own the property, in fact, it's owned by the trust and your only interests are in the avails and proceeds, which may 
flow from the property, then you as a beneficiary do not have any personal liability in that matter. So that's a very great place to be. And it's something that most attorneys don't know, frankly. And that's uh, one of the other things about when you, you know, you get the right information, yeah. you're able to pick up some additional things that even attorneys don't know. Very good. Kenneth Cole says here, please thank Lou for that amazing insight into trust and what to expect with a closing attorney. This is an amazing interview. Nice. Yeah, baby. Thank you, Kenneth. I appreciate that. Uh, Lou, will you talk about the certified affordable housing program that you have? What is that? I, I will. You know, it, it's, it's a thing. It's an interesting thing over the years. Uh, you know, I'm founding president of National RIA back in the day. Uh, before that, it was Real Estate Leadership Association of America. I was vice president, president of that. And then I took that organization, transformed it into National RIA. This was back in 1993. Yeah. And one of the things that I knew at that time and certainly have seen ever since then is that real estate investors have a bad name. You know, when somebody out in the public hears the term real estate investor, they don't have the warm and fuzzies. Let's face it. They think you're lying, cheating, stealing, money grubbing, good for nothing. Welcome to your industry. <laughs> so, so I say, you know, if, if we could actually get credit for who we are and what we do, you see, what we do is we buy dilapidated properties, run down properties. We restore them by hiring people locally, buying supplies locally. We restore, we pay back taxes. We, the school, uh, local schools are, are in, in, increased by the number of folks that we move into the properties and enrolling in those schools. The entire community is enhanced by our work, but we get no credit for that. So I realized that uh, a magic word out there in the world is affordable housing. And what is it that we do? Affordable housing. That's exactly who we are. That's exactly what we do. And in fact, uh, we don't even sell properties or rent properties to people that can't afford them. Mm -hmm. So affordable housing is not the price of the home. It's what the person can afford. And so by our methodology of actually attracting the person first, discovering who they are, how much they have to put down, how much they can afford on a monthly basis, then we provide affordable housing for them. We go purchase the right price, the right house in the right neighborhood for them. They approve it. We go ahead and close on it. They move in and they've moved in uh, to our affordable housing program. So we call it the path to home ownership. And so what I do is certify people in offering that program locally. It's called the path to home ownership. And through my program, they become certified affordable housing providers as six days of training. There's some steps in the process, there's testing. And then as a result of that, they have the right to use the brand called certified affordable housing provider. They get the name badge, they yeah. get uh, certificates, certification. Uh, they, a lot of my licensees have, wrap their vans, wrap their vehicles, trucks, cars, everything else. They've got, you know, some of them have grown to have offices now. They've got teams. They, they're just doing amazing things in their local communities. And I get very, very excited about it because I'm just seeing transformations happen all over the country. We're helping people to end up with home ownership that otherwise would not have had an opportunity to do so. And our local certified affordable housing providers are doing that. And they're making a very nice living as well. Yeah. The cool thing I love about it is finding the buyers first, uh, because like in any type of real estate that I've ever done, the easiest deals are always the ones where I have the buyers first. It's like, um, it's so much easier to shop for what buyers want than to sell them what you have. Isn't it? Oh, like yeah. I heard this analogy once. It's like taking a bowl of spaghetti, walking down the street and trying to sell this bowl of spaghetti to people. They're going to think you're weird. But if you go out and you say, hey, listen, what would you like for dinner? I'm going to go buy it for you or order it for you, whatever. And they tell you, I'll have a burrito. And you go, I'll have a, I'll have a whole enchilada. So I say, yeah, right, baby. and I'll go make them a whole enchilada and I give it to them. And uh, they're like, they buy it. So it's, it just makes it so much easier, doesn't it? When you can do that. And it, the it, cool thing about the program that you have is it kind of gives a certified stamp of approval. Like this is somebody who's been trained, who knows what they're doing. And uh, it helps even if you have a license now, a real estate license, because then 
it, it even gives you that much more credibility. It so, does. In fact, uh, one of the things that we do is um, I have uh, when we go talk with a seller or a lender, we have a book called doing good while doing well. And we actually present this book to our seller and it's, it's loaded with stories of people throughout the country that are doing exactly what we're doing. And so as a result of that, there's a lot of credibility that comes to in front of the seller at that time. You know, I say, listen, if you expect to be able to take over someone's existing financing or you expect them to carry back financing, which are two of my favorite things I've already told you 40 years in the business, I've never been to the bank of qualified for loans. Well, if, if you expect that to happen, you better have a lot of credibility. There, be, there better be some really good reasons for people to give you that opportunity. Well, and so that's one of the reasons that we give all of our potential sellers and our potential lenders, we always give them the book uh, to underscore that credibility and to have them have something in their hand that they can look over and realize, okay, this guy, this gal, they're, they're part of a nationwide network of affordable housing providers. They're not just out there by themselves kind of hanging on a string and maybe they might make the payments and maybe they might not make the payments. These people have gone through training. They've gone through certification. And it's like that comfort level that people get when they talk to a real estate agent or a mortgage broker, you know, they've got, they've, they've got some experience and some background and some training. So it definitely helps. Nice. People are asking for the link. Just give me the link already, right? How do I yeah, get it? Yeah, baby. <laughs> well, um, you can, there's actually several different links. Uh, there's certifiedaffordablehousingprovider.com and okay. you can learn more about the certification program. Certified. I'm going to write this down right now. Okay. Certified what again? Affordable. Okay. Housing provider.com. Let me put that up there. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. Certified, Certified affordable, affordable housing provider.com. There we go. There's one of them. Give another then, link. Sure. Um, would you like me to uh, give your folks a book? Doing good. Yeah. Doing good while doing uh, well. How do we get that book? Okay. Get doing good book.com. All right. Let me put it up there. Get doing good book.com. Get. Uh, doinggoodbook.com. I love it. That's a beautiful thing. And uh, so you guys can get the digital version or we'll ship you a book as well. And uh, yeah, you can get that. And uh, I'm looking just, at Amazon. It's $25 on Amazon. Right <laughs> yes, now. it is. <laughs> Wait a minute. I don't want to, I don't want to get it for free. What are you talking oh, about? Oh, you don't? Oh gosh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I just, I just like to give stuff away. Um, and you know, the fun thing is that when people see what this is, they get very excited about it. So I enjoy the process of teaching and training people to build amazing businesses. And, uh, we've, we've certainly had some great success with that over the years in our world. Yeah. We've helped, we've helped a lot of people to build multi-million dollar businesses. Uh, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a fun process to see people build what, we do locally. I just tell them, look, I'm going to teach you what we do and you're just going to Xerox copy exactly what we do. And we're going to be there to support you through the process of building this business. And it's a legacy as well. So you get a name in the community, you're helping people, the mayor's office, the city council, the county commission, everybody gets excited about who you are and what you're doing to help. You know, it, it also is great for PR. I encourage my people to get, get in touch with the newspaper, the local media, get on the morning shows, all of that sort of thing, and really get your name. Usually we're running from all those people, right? <laughs> we want to run to all those people and let them know that we're a different kind of real estate person in the community. You know, uh, I did the link wrong, by the way. I did provider with an O. Uh, it's certified affordable housing provider with an E, right? That's right. Certified affordable housing provider. Nice. Com. And then uh, we have a three day training and we call it millionaire jumpstart. So if you want to give them that one, that's millionaire jumpstart.com. And uh, that's where I'm able to show people from stem to stern, soup to nuts, kind of our entire business model. And so what happens is that I'm teaching you all of our buying tricks of not going to banks and not qualifying for loans. We have a presentation process that we do with the sellers. So I teach that during the class. 
you learn about how we hold the properties for long-term and maximum profits. Yeah. Uh, we have about 25 different profit centers over and above the difference between the mortgage and the rental amount. There's, you know, that's the typical spread for a landlord, but ours is 25 more profit centers above that. And that, yeah. so I teach that during that training and also teach about trust there. So they get a special manual and it's got forms in it and we take everybody through the process so that, for that three, three I know days. A lot of people are interested in that Lou millionaire jumpstart.com. Hopefully I spelled it right there. Yeah, baby. Um, that's a four day workshop. Is that what you said? That's three days. Three that's day workshop. Three day training. Uh -huh. um, you, you do a workshop, a training almost every month, right? Yep. I, I've heard, I've not been to one yet. I'd love to come someday. <sighs> oh yeah. 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 Well, this one's coming up uh, December six, seven and eight in Atlanta, December six, seven and eight in Atlanta. And you're welcome to come love for you to see it and, uh, and bring a herd of folks. I can't uh, come then. <laughs> I have heard, seriously, although I've heard so many people speak so highly of your workshops and uh, just get tremendous amount of value, learn a ton. And um, so I'd really recommend you guys check this out. Go to millionairejumpstart.com. Cool. I, I sure do appreciate that, Joe. And absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, it's a fun process when people learn that this is transferable, you know, that mm -hmm. they can, learn the information, they can take it, they can use it. And then they realize, you know, when they make money with it, they say, aha, you know, that's kind of, uh, that's something I didn't have before. That's not an approach that I was making in the past. And so you think back on all the deals that you didn't make because you didn't have that information and you go, ay, ay, ay. you know, if I had just had that information, I would have been able to do all these other deals and made all that other money as well. Oh yeah. You know, especially with the whole thing, affordable housing in the news almost every day, you can't get away from it. Um, being able to talk about being a certified affordable housing provider is going to open up so much more doors, so many more doors and opportunities. Um, and it, it puts yourself in a better light, right? Um, with the public when you can present yourself like this. I, I love that concept. It's really, and, and it's not like you're making something up. It's actually being who you are. Right. And so when you're being who you are, you're very authentic and people really respect it. They appreciate it. That's why we require people to go through the training uh, because this is not something to be taken lightly. It's something if not done correctly, it could damage other certified affordable housing providers. So we want to make sure people are trained correctly yeah. and that they're offering the path to home ownership in a way that really is authentic and really does help the community really does help the folks that can end up with home ownership. And in fact, take them down the path, just as I'm describing, take them down the path to end up with home ownership. Yeah. Really good. Calvin's got a good question here. Good show. Yeah. Is this certified affordable housing program a nonprofit? You know, it sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> it, it Hopefully does. it's not. Uh, some folks that join us actually are nonprofits. Uh, so we, we make no distinction. Uh, most of the folks that are certified affordable housing providers do have local for-profit companies. And there's an interesting concept in the world. Uh, it's called a zebra company. And that means it's for profit for purpose. Oh. Uh, so the idea is that you do have behind your business, you do have a purpose for being in business. And it's not just to make money for yourself and your family, but it's also to make a difference in the community. And that's who we are in our community. And that's what I teach other people to be in their communities as well. I love it. Ken Cole says, thanks to you, Joe. I've been introduced some, to some amazing people since joining your program. Edna says, this is the best explanation of land trusts I've ever heard. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, baby. Thank you, Edna. So um, any final parting words, Lou, before we end this? I appreciate your time too. We've already gone a half hour over what I asked. <laughs> My, I how time flies. <laughs> We're having fun. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know, the, my parting words are that if you have an entrepreneurial mindset, if you have an entrepreneurial spirit, you enjoy making a difference in the lives of others. Uh, this is an amazing business for that purpose. I love people. I love being able to talk to sellers and listen to them in a consultative way and really discover what their issues are. What, what, what's your, tell me, What's, and in fact, we have this, this, uh, on my seller questionnaire, we say, 
what's happening? You know, tell, tell me what's happening. And then we just shut up and let them talk. And so then we discover what their true issues are. And then we can actually put together an offer that can make sense to them and make sense to us too. Uh, so we go through a process, a presentation process to do that. And I would just say that there is a great way that you can approach this business. We call it the street smart way of doing business. You don't have to go to banks. You don't have to qualify for loans. There's 37 different ways you can structure the deal. So you don't have to leave <laughs> when they don't take your one offer. You, you know, there's 37 different offers you can make. Uh, and so when you discover that there's more to the story, then uh, we just love to help people learn that process. And I would just encourage all of you that it's available for everyone. You know, sometimes in life we kind of say, well, that's them over there. And because they had this education or because they had that benefit or whatever the story was that they, they have a, an opportunity to do something I can't do. Well, that's not true because I definitely was a kid from the other side of the tracks, definitely didn't have any money, didn't have a father, didn't have any relatives in this country. There were no programs back then to tap into and have the government pay for us. I mean, there was nothing. And I was able to come from there to here. And I will tell you that you can absolutely duplicate everything that I'm doing. We have the most diverse group of folks that are doing our program. You, you will be shocked and amazed yeah. just who's involved in my program. I mean, they are from every walk of life, every kind of handicap. I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, and it just proves that it's completely duplicatable for every single person. So I would just inspire everyone. Don't ever take no for an answer. Don't stop, get in there stay in there. It's the best gig ever. It's the best gig I've ever found. Oh, that's awesome. All right. So good. I'm going to give you guys one more time, the three links that Lou just gave away, certified affordable housing provider.com. All right. And by the way, you can get all these links on, on, on the show notes at real estate investing mastery.com or just Google real estate investing mastery or Joe McCall podcast. And uh, you can find this episode. You're going to get a transcript of the episode. You'll get wow. the video of it. And you get all the show notes, which, which include the link. So if you're driving, don't try to go on your phone right now and type in certified affordable housing provider because you're going to spell it wrong. And you're going to screw it up. We don't want anybody to have a wreck. Don't do it on your phone. Um, so go check the show notes out. Uh, but that's going to give you more information on how to become a certified affordable housing provider. Also, Lou's going to give away his free book, Getting Doing Well by Doing 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 Good by Doing Well. Uh, Yes. Uh, doing good while doing well, right? <laughs> for free. Or you can go to Amazon and spend 25 bucks for it. Doesn't matter. <laughs> but uh, get doing good book.com. Get doing good book.com. And nobody does events and workshops better than Lou. Go to millionairejumpstart.com to, uh, to check that out. Thank you so much, Mr. Lou, for being on the show. Uh, this is, I've, I don't know if I've ever done a uh, podcast with more comments and re, and people saying things like, yeah, you guys are great. Thanks, Sheila. Many thanks to both of you for your time and knowledge. Ken Cole, gentlemen, thank you. This has been amazing. And tons and tons that uh, I'm not even showing you here, but um, this has been good. Thank you very Excellent. much. Excellent. Well, thank you, Joe. I appreciate the opportunity. And guys, just thank Joe tons and tons for what he does. He really brings you some great information from everywhere and so much good stuff. You got to stay tuned and just thank you again, Joe, for having me on board. Thank you, Lou. Lou, hold on one second as I end this podcast here. Don't go anywhere. But guys, okay. thanks again. Go check out the show notes at realestateinvestingmastery.com. If you like this podcast, leave us a review in iTunes, please. Give us a thumbs up if you're watching this in YouTube or Facebook, share this podcast because there's a lot of people out there that need to hear this stuff and um, appreciate it all very much. Thank you guys. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah, baby.